Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Tuesday, June 9, 2020. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? Let's keep things relatively simple. What jumps off the screen at us on the daily chart? Really, nothing. And when I say nothing, it's really from a lack of excitement standpoint. There's always something on the chart, obviously. So what do we have? We have a similar ranging day to yesterday. It was, for all intents and purposes, almost an inside day, which means the range of today would be inside of yesterday it's slightly outside but for the most part it was just a sideways day the s p down two and a half points or 25 s p handles it's a down day but it's not a big deal type of down day okay fair enough but what do we have going forward and by the way and we'll get to the forward part in a second let me go backward to the fact that the market really didn't do much today we had a gap down at the open went a little bit lower, tried to rally back up, and finished the day very near the opening print. Hence, you have a pseudo-doji candle. And don't read into that, it's really meaningless. We have a market that was very, very close to its breakdown candle high. By the way, there's no rule that says it has to get to the breakdown candle high. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But you can see where the bulls are starting to run out of steam, potentially. We'll see what happens tomorrow. But for now, they couldn't get above yesterday's high. Now, they're up a lot. And to have a slight down day after being up from really SPY 276 to where we are in just a matter of a few weeks. How many down days have we had in between? Four. Today is number five. And that's from the low on May 14th right over here. So let's look at both sides of the tape. We have to play umpire. Let's look at the northern stuff first. And what that is is basically the same as it was. The same area in between the high from yesterday, the high from today, and right around 326, give or take. That would be that spot where, and remember, this was in the short term. This was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday type stuff. That would be the spot where they would be unlikely to just blow right through. Now let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the other side. So all of a sudden we get past Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're into Thursday, Friday, next week type stuff. And the market hasn't gone up there yet, but it's edged lower. It hasn't collapsed, but it's hanging around. So what constitutes hanging around? Maybe they filled the gap down at 310. Maybe they didn't even come close to the gap at 310. We'll get to more of that in a few moments. The concept is, from a 30,000-foot view perspective, the market would be essentially doing another one of those recocking of the guns, setting the stage, setting the curtain call for another leg higher, and that would be the case where the 324, 5, and 6 area wouldn't necessarily be the same type of overhead resistance that it would be yesterday, today, tomorrow type thing. So what we can say about that is the longer they don't do those numbers and they ever head back up, the more likely it is they trade through those numbers on the way back up if they're doing that. Let's talk about the other side for a moment. And first, we're going to drill down to an intraday 15-minute chart. Here's what we've got as far as I'm concerned. We have a move lower, which is essentially a flagpole for all intents and purposes. Now we have, instead of a bear flag pattern, we essentially have a bearish wedgish pattern, right? I like to use that term, wedgish. It's not a real word. I made it up. And we had a number on the board today. The number was SPY 322. There it is. What's he talking about? What do you mean we had a number at SPY 322? Inside the numbers members were privy to what would be overhead resistance at 322. Now they busted through a couple of times by a few pennies, but they continued to fail at 322. 322 was overhead resistance. And there he goes again with inside the numbers. This is where you'll find 322 probably a dozen times. We knew a couple of things, and what I'll do is to move things along... I'll scroll up after I summarize 
what's important to look for. What I can count on are the traders that think this information is important and they want to see if it matches up with what the commentary is against what's actually happening in real time in the market. Then they'll take the time to read the notes, stop the video, and go to a chart and see what happened throughout the day. If you're not interested, you'll just blow right by and therefore everybody wins. We're focused on a couple of things. We're focused on the big fat round number. This is tour guide stuff. 3200 that's first thing in the morning that's right out of the gate the early stuff also yesterday's lows at about 3190 below that we had another spot you know the routine this is the s p e-mini futures contract right of the vertical line is today's activity here's a five minute chart 3190 is the lower horizontal trend line 3200 is the upper one and what you'll notice is the numbers on the board, meaning the commentary, the numbers on the board jive with what the market thinks are important numbers. So now we can scroll along and you can stop and restart anytime you like. I urge you to take a gander at what's being said, the outlook, the schematic that's laid out throughout the day. And by the way, we'll get back to stocks on the move in a few moments. We always want to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. For now, let's scroll up through the notes so you can read the commentary and then focus on the important stuff. 3200, 3190, and then on the way back up, we're talking SPY now. You'll see 322 is going to be and was overhead resistance. So the bottom line is, and you'll see this said also, as the day goes on, you'll see the market begins forming this bearish wedgish formation. So if that's the case, that generally will play out to the downside under normal garden variety market conditions using our 80-20 rule. So that being the case, we have to know where we're going to be wrong in the trade if in fact the market's not going to do the thing where the bear wedge pattern plays out down south and instead it fails and the market continues going higher. Remember, the longer time frames are pointed up. There's nothing technically wrong with the market. We're talking short-term stuff right here. If, in fact, short-term stuff develops into longer-term stuff, so be it. But we have to take it one step at a time, one day at a time, if, in fact, we're treating this as a business. So the most important thing that we could know is if... We're interested in the short side. The bearish wedge pattern is going to play out down south, whether it's late today or into tomorrow or some other time. We have to know what takes that off the table. What took that off the table was 322. You'll see 322 repeated over and over and over again because of its importance. You'll see right here, line in the sand, 322. If you're trading in the market, you can't afford to be flying blind. You have to know thy numbers. If you don't know thy numbers, at least come somewhere where the person that you're listening to or reading from knows thy numbers. And it takes time. You're not going to be comfortable with my numbers right away. Case in point, stocks on the move. We had seven opportunities on the board Four actually hit their price objective, and we'll take a look at those charts in a moment. The point that I wanted to make is, you have to see this work for a while. If you're new here and you haven't seen but a couple of these videos, either go back and watch a dozen from the past, just pick random ones, and look what happens with the commentary, stocks on the move. You can see what's happening inside the numbers every single day. Therefore, you get comfortable with hearing the same thing, the same type of information presented in the same way you see the numbers work day in day out 80 percent of the trades work 20 percent don't it's just a consistent approach to the market day in and day out we'll take a look at delta american airlines save and hawaiian airlines it was airline day it was transport day when we get to the transports you'll understand they got killed and obviously, stuff inside the transports had to get killed to bring the transports down. It was the airlines, it was the cruise lines, and it was other stuff. When you wake up in the morning and you take a look at what's on the board, you don't know what the market 
is going to present that day. You don't know what type of opportunity. You don't know if there's going to be an opportunity that day. You don't know if it's going to be a home run, triple, double, or base hit. You have no idea. Therefore, again, treating this as a business, we take what the market gives and we move it along. We're thankful, at least I'm thankful, for whatever the market gives. Here we've got Delta Airlines. The number on the board was 3415. The secondary entry was 3242. They never got there. So it was only the first entry that was in play. You can see it was a bit of a rodeo ride. You can also see the importance of 3415. It's subjective whether it's 3420 or 3405 or whatever the number you want to believe it is. It's in and around 3415 where the market centered around all day long. They gave a trade a number of times for any trader that wanted to stick around for a positive trade, but they never gave the rocket ride. They never gave the double, triple, or home run. That's okay. We take what the market gives. The takeaway, the importance of the number. Now, here's a little trading school 101. We've got stocks on the move on the board. You can see an entire sector is under pressure. The entire sector is getting killed. The S&P 500, Dow, across the board, not necessarily the NASDAQ, interestingly enough, but the S&P is down. So you have a down S&P. You're into a sector that's getting killed across the board. Caution is warranted. But the other thing that's most important is you're going to be quick on the trigger to take profit in that scenario. The other scenario is something like this. The market is floating higher, meaning the S&P is floating higher. It's trading higher. We're buying a stock that's down in the morning session. The rest of the market, for the most part, is up. Just for argument's sake, from a logical standpoint, this is part of that common sense market analysis stuff. That scenario is safer than buying when the market is down, the sector is down, and you're buying a stock in that sector that's down. Now, it didn't impact in a negative way today the trades. That's not what I'm intimating. What I'm saying is how we can treat that type of scenario going forward, just trying to have a takeaway from the day's activity. Let's use it as a learning experience if we didn't already know that type of information. It's part and parcel to reading the tape. American Airline also sat down for quite the buzz cut the closing price yesterday, $20.31. Our entry was $18.35. You can see what happened. Spiked it. Not stopped out for you home gamers out there. And then it had a nice rip higher up to $18.97. Now, let's put that in perspective. We'll call it $65 or so cents for argument's sake. Or how about $0.62 cents if you're doing the current and widely accepted math. That's also over a 3% rip higher in a matter of seconds. So traders are taking profit. You see it came back down relatively quickly. However, ample opportunity to stuff your pockets. How about save Spirit Airlines? Here's a great example of one of those trades that didn't and then did happen. 2261 and 2195 were numbers on the board early in the morning. The stock made a low, this is in the midst of its morning haircut, of 22.75 and had a really tremendous rip higher. Over 24 bucks in a matter of minutes. So that's the trade that we were looking for. It didn't happen because they pulled up short of the number. Now, that's a no trade. Even when they come back down, that number's off the board. If you've been around for more than five minutes, you know that but we still have a second number on the board. The second number is not off the board, it is on the board. The second number is there for one of two reasons. Either it's to produce a secondary trade opportunity or on the first trade opportunity, many times when the numbers are close together, we take a portion of a trade or the position at the first number and the rest or a secondary position or portion of the position at the second number, you have an average in the middle and there's your trade, there's your number. Why does that happen? Because I can make the case for either number. And I'm doing this, remember, at 7.30 in the morning, 7.15, 8.15. I'm doing it long before the opening bell. How about Hawaiian Airlines? You see the closing price yesterday up at 21.20. 
Big time buzz cut. 1936 was the number on the board. This was the trade that didn't happen in save. It happened in Hawaiian. Look at the low here. 1926. What's the high minutes later? 2024. And that certainly falls into the camp of nice rip. Let's go to camp. Camp IWM. So it was a down day, but let's pull back the curtain a little bit and see what else is going on. It was a pretty large down day in comparison to and against the SPY. So 1.8% down against the spider that was down about 7 or 8 tenths of 1%. You know the routine. This is my favorite market leading indicator. So on one hand, there's no trouble on the tape. We're above all the moving averages. It's in an uptrend. But on the other hand, and we talked about this last night, pretty much a good time for it. We talked about the fact that we're extended away from home base. What does that mean? It means the market is too far from what it likes to cuddle up to or snuggle up to, which is the 20 period moving average. It never likes to get too far away from home base. Think about that for a moment. Aside from the people that like to travel, think about using the 80-20 rule. Do you like to get too far away from home base? Maybe now isn't the time to ask that question since we're all quarantined to home base or have been for the most part over the last three months. But generally speaking, really we don't like to get too far away from home base. Well, the market isn't any different. Why should it be? What is the market? By definition, the market is a series of people making bets, wagers, investments, trades, whatever you want to call it. All those together, mashed together in a bucket, is the market. So it's people making up the market. Now we're going to have a Weisenheimer that says, what about the algos? Well, here's what I would say. Who programs the algos? People program the algos based on what? based on what they think other people are going to do, based on what's happening now, based on what happened in the, in the past, under a similar set of circumstances, and certainly that's a glazed over version, but you get the concept. It still boils down to people, the charts, and money flow. Now, let's talk about this for a second in comparison to the SPY. So here we are, We've already breached the lows from Friday. The low here was 149.55, and the low today is lower. The low today is 149.06. Now, they closed back above it, but that's a breach of the low from Friday. So we know that as a leading indicator, my favorite leading indicator, the IWM is pacing ahead of the SPY. Where's the SPY in comparison? We have yet to reach Friday's lows. So what could we say about that? If we have another down day, for example, on Wednesday, and the IWM is in no man's land closing hourly below Friday's low, what you can say is that there's a high probability that the SPY will be somewhere in the vicinity of its Friday's lows. Where are Friday's lows? We'll call it 317 for argument's sake. There should be an assemblance of support in and around 317. Now, whether they come inside of Friday's low, meaning into no man's land, come up short, that's a real-time type of thing. That's an inside-the-numbers type of thing. But running a test of 317 would be normal garden-variety market behavior. And by the way, using the 80-20 rule, on the first run after trading away from 317, there should be support in and around 317, if for nothing else, from an intraday perspective. Now, opening the day, if they should do this, I'm not saying they will, just saying if they did, if they open below Friday's low, open the day on Wednesday below that number, that's a different story altogether. That opens the door wide open to go fill the gap down around 310. Again, that's a tomorrow thing. That's an inside the numbers thing. This is the night before, so we do our thing. Remember this? We talked about the VIX last night. We talked about the VIX into its 200 period moving average. Here's a bounce off of it. We're seeing a down tape, meaning an S&P 500. It's no surprise. It's exactly what we said last night. Where's resistance? 28 and a quarter, about 31.50. 
And then about 3275, 3250 in that neighborhood. You could put those on a sticky note if you're a participant in the VIX using some of those exchange traded products. My second favorite market leading indicator will take a look at what's going on with the folks down at the transportation department. So it's similar to the IWM. It's ahead of the power curve. We're below Friday's low. So here we have IWM spiked through Friday's low but closed above. The transports got through by quite a bit Friday's low and closed below. Now they were saved by the 200 period moving average but below Friday's low, is that more important than staying above the 200 period moving average? I can't answer that here. Whatever I say, the opposite will happen. So what we'll do is we'll just wait to find out. It's not positive closing below Friday's low. So you can see we have my two favorite market leading indicators leading to the downside, the transports, my favorite canary in the coal mine. Look at that. Never closed above that tail candle. We talked about it on Friday. We talked about it over the weekend, which was not Friday. We talked about it yesterday. And then they pulled the rug out. Back to the SPY for a second. Just from a 30,000 foot perspective, forget the actual number that they hit or didn't hit. This is a general area near the high of those breakdown candles is where the market generally, A, will be attracted to like a magnet, and B, find overhead resistance. Now, what they do with that overhead resistance is a whole different ballgame. Are they just going to run sideways for the most part back and forth? That's one thing. Are they going to really be rejected? That's something else. What we try and do is get clues from the other markets and what they're doing. Just wanted to make sure that we're clear on all that. And just when you thought it was safe to get back in the pool, we take a look over at the Qs, the NASDAQ, the folks out in Silicon Valley, and what do we find? We find a market that continues to go higher. Nobody cares about anything except buying up the Qs, buy the dip crowd, buy the buy high and sell higher crowd, just don't sell, just keep buying crowd. All crowds pile into the Qs. We know this is going to come back in. What's going on here? Let's take it from a different perspective. The NASDAQ composite is at 99.53 and change. What's going on here is they were going to 10,000. What's the high of day? 10,002, spot 50. Why do they say spot 50 instead of 0.50? I don't know. It's a market thing. I'm just playing along. So now we'll see what kind of mustard the Qs have in the jar now that the NASDAQ composite reached 10,000. It was a big number, big fat round number, big magnetic number. That's what was going on. How about the XLF? Down 2.5% today. Again, we're talking Monday's lows. You can see what's going on here. The markets that we like to look at for leading indications of what's to come. Now, make the distinction between indicators on a chart with flashing lights and using other markets trying to tell me, tell us, where the money flow is going, where the money flow is coming from, where it's coming out of. When you can understand where the money flow is going, or at least coming from, it helps you put the storyline together along with what the charts are doing. That's why you watch these other markets. This is different. I want you to make the distinction when I say indicators. This isn't the stuff from Joe's Indicator Shop. Now this one, the low from Friday is 26.15. Today's close is 26.17. Obviously, you see the tail. The low was lower. So they made a choice to close inside of Friday's low. No accidents, no coincidences. That's what they chose to do. We take that information, we file it away, we put it on the table as a puzzle piece, and we move along. Smash Mouth was up today. Can we make much out of this? Here's the reason we can't. Because the NASDAQ composite was just going to 10,000. So everything inside of the tech stuff, we're just going to give it a mulligan and say everything was going to 10,000. The SMH was going to new highs. They put in the tail. Until and unless they close a day above the tail from the other day, above that tail high, then that's a high. And I think that's a lot of information. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That's all true and accurate information. 
I'm going to pull the ripcord here. It's everything we wanted to and intended to discuss today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.